Hello, everyone. I am here with Jeannie Dietrich today, who is the founder and CEO of Armit & Dietrich, a Chicago-based integrated marketing communications firm. She's also the founder of the professional development site for PR and marketing pros called Spin Sucks Pro and co-author of Marketing in the Round. Jeannie is also, also the author of the PR marketing blog Spin Sucks, which is a 2012 Sizian top, top 100 blog and the 2010 and 2011 Reader's Choice Blog of the Year, a top 42 content marketing blog from Junta42, a top 10 social media blog from Social Media Examiner, and an Ad Age Power 150 blog. And in addition to all that, she also co-hosts Inside PR, which is a weekly podcast about communications, social media, and where they all meet and intersect. And today, we are going to talk about awesome blog topic ideas for B2B marketing and a little bit more. Jeannie, how are you doing today? I am well. How are you? I am doing excellent. Always excited to talk with you. It's not only fun, but it's informative, and I'm sure you're going to have some other crazy things to say, which also makes it more fun. So I'm cool. super no excited. <laughs> no pressure at all. You just got to be fun, entertaining, educational, and right. you need to make people money got yesterday. It. Can you do it? Oh, okay. All right. I can do all that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Great. Well, cool. Well, um, just to kind of get into just the beginning, just to ease into this topic real quick, is I um, want to talk about possibly if there's a difference in strategy between a B2B, which is business to business versus B2C, mm -hmm. which is business to consumer company when developing your content plan. So just wanted to get your thoughts on if, you know, just at the beginning, how you might approach this differently, if there is a difference. I don't think there is. And, you know, we hear, we hear stuff like this all the time. Where we hear, well, we're a B2B, that doesn't work. We understand that it works for consumer, but that doesn't work in our business. Or my favorite one is my business is unique. Okay, because mm -hmm. you don't you don't sell to people, I guess. Mm -hmm. You do you sell mm -hmm. to aliens? Because if you sell right. to people, your business is not unique. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That always gets me too. Like especially like you know the account based marketing and all this stuff for B two B. I'm like, but those are people. <laughs> you know? People. There's there's a person behind that CEO title, right? Correct. So yeah. that that that's yeah. interesting that you bring that up. So. It, obviously, the kind of stuff you write obviously is unique to every single company, pretty much. But of as of far as just the beginning, getting the strategy going, if you're B two B, B two C, don't think that there's like some gargantuan difference when you're just developing your content plan. It all starts kind of at the same place, of which we'll dig into. Is that kind of how you see it? Yeah, it is uh, how I see it, and I also think you have to be thinking about. And I'm, I'll give you some. I have four ways to dig into content, which we'll talk about in a minute, but, um, you know, figuring out what your unique perspective is, because that's what's going to, to be, make the difference. It's not going to be the, oh, we're a B2B company, so we have to do this strategically differently. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Yeah, and, and on that note, <clears throat> I think, you know, your unique perspective is, is a very key point that it's kind of has a, in my mind, a hidden underlying meaning there is, uh, you know, this day and age, I mean, what hasn't been written about already, right? Uh, I mean, right. It's, it's just, I mean, <laughs> yes. you, it, oh, people have already talked about that, but you haven't talked about it yet, right? right. And well, so, yeah, that's a unique. example. I just, I just um, talked to a reporter at Inc. yesterday for on behalf of a client, and the, the client does, essentially they're consultants, he wouldn't like that I use that word, but essentially they're consultants that help business owners uh, change their business. So, you might be going through some sort of restructure. You might be transitioning from you to your kids. You might be going bankrupt and have to restructure from that perspective. So there's there's a reason that you would hire these guys. And yeah, when you when you look at the publications, people have written about this stuff. But what I really what I think his unique perspective is twofold. One, he's a former U.S. Army captain, um, so he brings that process into the work that he does. And the other piece right. is that he. He, unlike typical business consultants, has built and sold four different companies. So he brings that expertise to his content as well, where most business consultants can just talk about it from the work they've done with clients. He's actually done it. Um, and yeah. that's the unique perspective he has. 
That's a, and that is a unique perspective. It, it, it truly is. I, I always value people who speak about this stuff who have done something also. It's, it, theory is one thing, right? But putting Correct. it in practice yes. is a whole nother. Yes. So when you have Completely both, different. when you're good at teaching and you have done, then it's like, okay, I'm paying attention now. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy, you push him hard. He'll be successful I know. because that, that is that is a very unique perspective. It absolutely is, and and I I would pay attention to what what somebody like that would have to say. So yeah, no, I hear you absolutely. So so getting started, where's the best place to start to gather good ideas? And again, we're gonna go ahead and just concentrate on B two B for now. Uh, just even though there's you know it's kind of you know one and the same as far as sure. a lot of the methodologies, but for the purposes of this podcast, we're going to be kind of concentrating specifically on B2B. So where would be the best place to start to gather up good ideas? Okay. I have four, four ways. Number one, four ways. sit with anybody who talks to prospects. So your sales team, new business development, executives, whoever it is that, ta- that goes to meetings with prospects and ask them what are the questions you're asked in those meetings. And it's gonna be everything from delivery and price to what makes you different, your point of differentiation and all that. But as you dig deeper and you start start asking more and more questions, you can come, easily come up with a list of, you know, 20 or 30 questions mm-hmm. that you get in sales meetings. And the reason you wanna do that is because if people are asking you those in sales meetings, they're also Googling them. Yep. So it becomes a great, those become great content. Now, so so that's number one. Number two, write down all of the questions your customer service department is asked. And you may not have a customer service department, but it could be anybody who works with a client. So your sales team, the executive team again, um, you know, account managers, anybody like that. So write down those questions. So at this point, you should have at least 20 questions, 10 for each of those. Then I want you to go to the website and download your frequently asked questions um, and look at those because you're going to have, you're going to revise those. Also go into your internal server or Dropbox or whatever you use internally Mm -hmm. and see if you have any frequently asked questions historically that are, you know, no longer on the website, but that you might be able to update. So that's number three. And then number four is go into your sent mail and Scroll through to see what kinds of questions your clients are asking that you're writing long answers to. So when you go into Wonderful. your set mail and you look at it from that perspective, you start to see a trend where you you tend to answer the same questions over and over again. Mm-hmm. If you have that as content on your website and you can just send a link, A, it's saving you time, B, it's driving traffic, and C, it starts to provide extra credibility in the, the customer's mind. Those are fantastic points, Sheeny. And what you just did for a company just getting started is they don't have to sit there and brainstorm. They need to go back and just look, you know, just yes. look. I mean, the brainstorming is <laughs> yes. going to be important, but the brainstorming is hard to do from a blank canvas. It's, it's in my opinion, hard. it becomes it becomes fairly fun and easy once you get going. But at the beginning, you might just have blank stares at each other, like, well, I don't know, let's talk yes. about our benefits. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the right price, content. You know, and all that. <laughs> you know, but once you get going and you get it, then, geez, like, you know, we personally have a monthly company happy hour where we, you know, brainstorm for, you know, one to two clients a week. And it's fun. It's love great. It. It's awesome. It. But it. at the love beginning, it. at the beginning, though, it's like, it's it's like you know you're getting that boulder rolling. It's difficult. So what you've done in this advice that you've given is you've gotten that boulder run. He's like, just go back and look. Just go back and right. look. What's what what have you already been talking about? And there you go. Um, and um, th- that's awesome. And one one that thing to add that could make this seamless, especially if you're a larger company that has a sales in a marketing department, is a tip that Marcus Sheridan goes. It goes that just um, kind of goes with what you're saying here, uh, but an easy, seamless way to communicate is just BCC your marketing department. Um, uh, whenever so sales smart. or CSR uh, answers a question, and then immediate yep. or, a, you know, not every single question, but the ones that they'd be like, oh, this is important. And that way you don't have the extra step of, hey, look at this, or yep. hey, look at that. And smart. then there's no more work Super for the smart. sales or CSR team. So that's a tip. That's that's actually one of my favorite tips I ever got from Marcus, and he's given lots of them. But that one right there, I was like, that's 
stupidly simple and genius, you know? Yes. So, yeah, so stupidly but it goes right in line with what you're saying. Yeah, so that's that's a great place to start, and I hope everybody goes back and listens to that, writes those down, and then just gets going, and then you immediately have, you know, probably six months' worth of content right away. Um, so that's awesome. Let's see here. Uh, what, what are some other – so once you get going here, so that's all internal. You know, you got your – anybody right, who talks right. to prospects where they say, write down the CSR questions, download your – you know, go back and look at what you knew, the frequently asked questions from the beginning, go through your sent mail. Okay. Now, I, after that, right, what, what are some other uh, good resources where you can dig to come up with some good topics? You know, once you get going and you go through all that and say, okay, great, okay, now what? And, of course, creativity plays a part, but, you know, I'm sure some people are going to need some more help. Uh, any suggestions? I have tons. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you what I do, and then people can pick and choose what works for them. Um, okay. I subscribe to, I don't know, a 91 newsletters. I know that because I have my inbox open. Uh, 91 newsletters I subscribe to, so I get those weekly. And they just I just set up a rule so they go to a separate folder so that uh, I don't, it's not hitting my inbox. You know, 91 of okay. those aren't hitting my inbox. I also subscribe to Smart Brief. So for mm -hmm. that – um, I subscribe to leadership, entrepreneurship, and social media. Mm -hmm. um, and those, again, go to an, a separate inbox or a separate mailbox so that it doesn't hit my inbox. Um, of course, I subscribe to um, – I have all sorts of blogs in Feedly. And then, you know, you're on the social networks. You're on Twitter. You're on Facebook. You're on LinkedIn. And you see articles, and you click it, and I do a terrible thing, which I shouldn't do, but I keep tabs open constantly. <laughs> <laughs> and then when yeah. I need inspiration, I go to – I hear yeah. you. You when never I need know. You never know. Right. I know. Yeah. Like, it's, but the problem with, with Evernote for me is that out of sight, out of mind. So it, Because it's literally out of sight. No, but I leave my I'm Evernote like, tab open, though. My Evernote tab is open. Still for me, I don't know. I can't – we should have a conversation about that yeah. because I can't – Because I had a big weird. problem with that. I had I had my staff, I had me hating myself and I had my staff hating myself because I was taking up all the bandwidth in the office because I literally would have like a hundred tabs open and literally because I was like I gotta read these I gotta read all this and then all of a sudden right. they would get behind and and then I'd be like oh so I finally went there and it's 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 made everybody's life better so um, anyways sorry sorry to digress so that's but, a great uh, tip as well um, yes. the, yeah then when I need inspiration I just go to one of those like this morning. I write at 5 a.m., and this morning I had no idea what I was going to write about for the blog. And so I just I just went to a couple of the tabs that I had open, and I found some inspiration, and then I wrote my blog post. Um, so I, I think that those are sort of good places to start just for inspiration. But also, once you start creating content and you're, you're, it's sort of top of mind, You'll start finding blog topics or visuals that you can use just out and about. You might be at dinner with friends and have a conversation that's interesting that leads to something. Or you might be somewhere and see something that you want to take a picture of or a video. Like, it becomes sort of part of your life the more you do it. And then just the whole world becomes your inspiration. Gotcha. I, I would like to kind of add a little tool that we have found that's really inexpensive, and you might want to use it too. Um, it's called StoryBase, and um, it just it helps you. You know, you start typing in stuff, and it gives you other questions. You might. I mean, it's it's. I don't know how What's much it, it is, but it, StoryBase Story just as it sounds. StoryBase.com. Hmm. You might want to go on it as we're talking here and just check it out and start typing in some stuff. It's. For the amount of money that you spend, um, it's going to give you huh. some pretty good ideas, um, and it's helped. And then also that you know that monthly company happy hour. Um, anybody who thinks that their creativity in one person, you know, one or two, or even like just the department, the marketing department thinks they have it all, they're um, they're <laughs> they're not you know, really doing the best thing for the company. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't believe how many people have good ideas. Shoot, I invite my wife. She, she's been, she's a writer by trade as far as she publishes a magazine and she does all the writing. So that's just her thing. She's creative and has to think. So I, I have her come to the happy hours because she's not, you know, in our intimate with our clients. But when you start, you know, brief them on it, she's like, Oh, what yep. about this? Yep. What about that? What about this? Yep. What about that? Love that? So get everybody involved, get everybody involved. And it's fun. I don't know, maybe not for everybody, but for me, it's, I don't know. I think it's a lot of fun when you just start brainstorming, you know? Um, I love but it. yeah, that, that, that's awesome. Is there, um, I mean, I, I, I think we, we, you know, and to kind of put it in perspective, you, you're saying you, you, um, or to put it in context, you, 
subscribe to these blogs that you mentioned and the kind of blogs that you mentioned. But everyone needs to know that Jeannie's in PR and marketing. So she's right. doing, you know, she's looking at stuff in her marketplace, which gives her other ideas. Okay. And I'm sure some of them are your competitors if I'm not, you know. Oh, yes. There. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yes. so people need to just go to their competitors go to, you know, the trades associations or whatever that's of theirs and then subscribe to your industry blogs. Don't just, you know, subscribe to the ones right. Jeannie mentioned unless you are in PR right. marketing, and then you're probably going to want to go Jeannie's blog and <laughs> see what she's doing. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but not that. Don't do that. But um, so, yeah, so, yeah, so d go to your marketplace, what makes sense for you, and that will start to give you some really good ideas. Okay. that that That's phenomenal. I mean, it, we're going to keep going here, but I, I think even just what we've talked about thus far um, can get people rolling here. Can absolutely awesome. get, get people. Rolling. But let's let's kind of go to the next step. Okay, so now we've gotten started, and we and as we've gotten started, we have a way to keep it going. Uh, as far as the content ideas, right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. who should the content um, slash ideas? mainly the content, I guess, be directed to or written for. And there's a big – I've been reading more and more and more about this. Joe Polizzi is, con is seemingly have t has turned to this as the Internet has gotten more crowded. This space has gotten mm -hmm. more crowded. So mm -hmm. uh, I just keep seeing a big push of really talking about who you're writing for and needing to concentrate on that. So what are your thoughts and your opinions in regards to that as far as who should it be directly written for? Well, it's sort of the it's it's the traditional way of, of doing marketing. So yeah, I always say that the marketing principles have stayed the same, it's the tools that have changed. Um, mm -hmm. so you have to have brand personas for your audience. What who okay. who are your customers? You know, people mm -hmm. say to me all the time, You have such a, a narrow niche because you only talk to PR people and I'm like, Yeah, but that's I mean, that's our customer. That's who that's who buys from us. That's who works with us. That's who we work directly with on the agency side. Like, yeah, I mean, I could probably expand out and do marketers or content marketing or, you know, marketing overall or whatever, but our niche is PR professionals. Um, yeah, so don't change the change, right? Right. So you have to, you have to figure out who, from that perspective, who is your customer and speak to them. Don't try to be all things to all people. And again, that that's not anything new. It's just that you're using a new tool to deliver your message. Okay, and then on that note, you know, again, this is B two B, right? So it's, it does get a little bit more specific as far as B two C in regards to this part of the strategy. This is where I think the differences start to come in. Um, so your content ideas should they be broad enough to speak to multiple people within an organization, or should you be centering on you know, one or maybe one or two? It's funny you ask this because we just had this conversation last week in a workshop I did. Um, and typically my answer would be I would really focus on the main decision maker. But the conversation we had last week was there's a group of influencers within that have a seat at the table that may not be the decision maker, but they influence the decision. Um, and so, yeah, in, that, in cases like that, I think you have to know your industry and your sales cycle and your your company, your customers so well that you can determine that. Do we have only one decision maker or are there two or three dis different decision makers? HubSpot's a great oh. example of this. HubSpot di dis discovered that they had three different buyers. They have agency buyers, they have small business buyers, and they have enterprise buyers. So they have – their content is divided that way. And so they have content that speaks to agencies, they have content that speaks to enterprise organizations and they have content that speaks to small businesses. Okay, on that note, now HubSpot, they're, you know, there's this little company, right? So they, they yeah, have, tiny uh, yeah, a teen, teeny tiny company that, that has teeny <laughs> tiny resources. I'm obviously right. being facetious. They're a large, huge company that has humongous resources. So I'm assuming, though, they're able to um, provide the appropriate amount of content plans for each individual one. But let's just say you're a company that's able to afford either by time or money or resources to put out one blog a week, which I feel is – it's the minimum, mm -hmm. but I also think it's enough to move the needle yeah, you know, for yeah. a normal company. Well, I'm glad you agree. I, I was being presumptuous there. I'm glad you agree. Um, but <laughs> So 
Okay, so now there's two, three people in an organization. What would you do? What would you do would I think you, you with, have to with choose. one block a week? You have to week? prioritize. You just okay. have to prioritize. Who's, okay, who's so important? in that case, if you don't have all the resources, go for now. Would you say say there are two? Would you do like two blogs a month that speak to one, two blogs that speak to the other? Would you just center on your one blog a week to the main decision maker? I would center it on the main decision maker, and then as you grow, which you will when you're doing it correctly, and you can add resources, then you can start to focus on the others. Okay. Well, you're being very consistent with what all the other experts are saying out there. <laughs> um, and I wasn't going to say that if you said something different, but it's super consistent <laughs> with what everybody's saying. Um, and um, and also, it's something I've struggled with personally, um, you know, especially when we're getting pulled different directions from clients. We want to hit this, and I've, you know, I've literally been given five to six to seven different types of people that they want to go after or personas or, you know, groups of demographics. And, and we're just finally like, no, one. You can't. Yeah. You have to choose one. one. Yes. You got to choose yeah. one. So uh, we finally were kind of trying to be, you know, work with people and be flexible. And then we're like, no, we're not doing it the right, you know, we got to go one. So yeah, we, I'm glad <laughs> yes. that, and there's a ton of talk about this as we're going through it, which is kind of weird. I guess we're not the only ones. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's see here. All right. So now we have a place to get our ideas going. We know who we should be directing them to. Now, what topics, ideas, in your opinion, should be to be put at the top of the list to be accomplished first? Because you probably have, like I said, you, and I'm not exaggerating here, assuming you do like one blog a week, you, you with what you have said, you know, your advice here, you, you're probably giving people six months, maybe even 12 months worth of topics. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Where do you start? So what should be accomplished at the top of the list? What should you do right away, uh, right when you get going? You know, I would prioritize um, based on the number of times that you're asked, asked a question. So, you know, for us, we're asked all the time, what's the difference between PR and marketing? And that's beyond oh, yeah. the that's beyond the price, how much do you cost, and what kinds of results can we expect, and all that. That's beyond all of those sort of basic questions that you'll get from everybody. What are the questions you get over and over and over again and prioritize that way? Okay. Okay, now what if you don't see that correlation necessarily? Like, you know, you just, you know, you kind of see it. You have 40 blog topics, four say this, two say this, two say that, one, you know, what, any other, any other stuff? And I think we've talked about this in the past. We might have mentioned in the past, but, you know, Marcus Sheridan has this big five, top five to go for. Yep. Have you read yep. over that before? Uh, I think we've yeah, talked about it in exactly the past. I don't exactly remember, yes. Yeah, I, I think he mentions, um, but what you're saying is awesome, but he also ha has some other advice about, like, um, you know, you say cost. And you you touched on that. Um, that was one of the bigger ones that he talked about. What are your thoughts on that? Like the cost of PR, you won't you won't say it costs it this much because I mean every you know every situation is a snowflake when it comes to that. But like talking <laughs> about like what goes into a cost, right? Because that isn't that what people are typing in the most probably for every it is. marketplace. Um, it, yeah, and I'm with Marcus on people should have pricing on their websites. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that in 2009, Marcus Sheridan and I were at dinner, and he said to me, why don't you have pricing on your website? And I said, because we're a PR firm and we customize based on what the client needs. So, you know, it could be $100,000 for one and $500,000 for another. You just don't know. And he said, mm -hmm. do you have – he said, do you have minimums? And I said, we do. And he goes, why isn't the minimum on your website? And I was like, I don't know, Marcus. Stop picking on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's awesome. But, yeah, he's definitely intense, too. You probably, you probably scared you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, fine, you're right. But he's right. And so when we put the minimums on our website, it, it did a couple of things. Number one, it got rid of the um, – conversations that I was having where people just kick the tires and then you get to the budget question at the end of the hour and they can't, they, you discover they can't afford you. That mm -hmm. was happening a lot. Um, yeah. And that never happens anymore. And then it also got rid of the, can I pick your brain questions? Um, which, you know, when you sell your brain for a living becomes kind of expensive if you're just sitting out and talking to people all day long and not doing work for clients. 
So it's gotten mm-hmm. rid of those two things, and he was right. That's he awesome. was right. You know, I was really uncomfortable about it, but he was right. I'll tell you, everybody's uncomfortable with it unless you're um... – commodity-esque type of thing, you know, it's like, this is the cost. And and what you mentioned is a dilemma, I think, almost every, for sure, every service-based, you know, industry goes through or company goes through. But the way you just phrase that, I think, is going to open up some people. I mean, um, and, and personally, we're just changing over to that. We did it a little bit, but I don't think we did it all the way. And the putting that minimum on there, that's awesome. So it really, you saw it happen in real life. You did it, you did it, you put it up there. Now, have you written about it? Um, maybe back then I did. I don't remember. I'm sure I did back then. I mean, it was, it's been six years ago at least. Okay. Cool. Well, okay. Well, awesome. All right. Now, um, moving to this next question here, I'm trying to see. Yeah, but like, how much should be written about your company and your products in regards to like a content plan? Because I think that's in your own probably the biggest confusion that people have. Yeah, because we go through and they get all these they get all these questions and all and a lot of them you, know, you say prioritize the number and probably a lot of them are going to be about your products and services, right? Uh, so people are going to sure. say, well, everyone's asking me about that. Should I write about our company? You know, the directions, how to get there. You know, how long we've been around, and this or that, or here's our product. So how much should be written about your company and your products versus you know, other types of questions people are asking. That stuff definitely belongs on your website, but it doesn't necessarily belong in your content plan. And when I talk about content, I'm talking about blogging, webinars, eBooks, white papers, checklists, guides, that kind of stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. The exception I would make is if you have a really technical business and you need to teach people how to do something, in that case, you can do it through video and use YouTube and then embed it on your site. Um, there are lots and lots of ways that you can create content and still talk about your company and products or services without saying, without being boring. So, like, mm-hmm. for instance, you know, I might write a piece of con- a, a blog post, for instance, that talks about um, we did this, this, and this for a client, and these were the kinds of results, and here's what you can learn from it. Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of my approach. You know, okay. I had a situation uh, about a month ago where I had somebody ask me, okay, you talk about PR metrics, and I understand, you know, this should be how we should measure all this and everything, but I don't, like, how how do you correlate that to sales? And so I took a case study that we had just done for a client that we, I mean, it was very clear how we correlated the work that we did to sales, and I wrote a blog post on it. So, yeah, it was about the work that we did, and it was sort of a case study, but it was in mm-hmm. a way that answered this person's question. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that's a very important point to take home because people are just chomping at the bit to talk about themselves and talk about the products because they're proud of them or else they wouldn't be owning a business, right? So, right. But just spin it a little bit differently, you know, change it a little bit differently. Make it sure – I guess at the end of the day, you need to see, okay, if we're, what, what we write about or what we've written, did this give somebody a point in order to take home, right, outside of them knowing more about myself, is that kind of a good way to to kind of think about that? Yeah. Well, let me give you an, an example. So the client I was just talking about earlier with the, that he's the former U.S. Army captain and he's built and sold for businesses. Uh, he just wrote a blog post last week called The Founder's Trap. And in it, he talks about, you know, the reason that businesses stall when the founder is still involved is for these five reasons. And it was, you know, he, he lists four reasons. And then the last reason was that they haven't hired outside counsel to help them. And, of course, the outside counsel would be them. So they mm-hmm. talk about their firm from that perspective. But, you know, mm-hmm. that was only one piece where the other four pieces of advice were not relevant to hiring them. That's a great example. That's a great example. And I'm sure he's being genuine, you know. He is being he, genuine, not, yeah. Yeah. He's absolutely being genuine, but, you know, just because you say something nice about yourself or, you know, you kind of – it's not pushing your agenda necessarily, but it doesn't make it wrong. You know, it doesn't make it inaccurate. You know, it could absolutely – and just make sure it's accurate. You know, don't fake it till you make it. Just be honest, and if part of the honesty (laughs) means that you're part of the solution, well, then that's all right. You know, go for it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. Not, that was going to, you know, actually one of my next questions was, you know, what are some good examples of lots of good topics? But, I mean, I think you've touched on that in, you know, in that specific way, and then everybody can go back and, and think about it that way. You know, if there's a problem, say, hey, here are some potential solutions, and one of them could be yours and, and, right. and uh, something that your product or service satisfies. So that that's awesome. Okay, um, as far as now getting into a little bit more of the technical sense in a way, how much should uh, keyword research play a part in this day and age? You know, I've seen, you know, in the past there was a huge, you know, you want to rank for this, want to rank for that, and, you know, obviously you do, but um, it's just gotten so crowded, and then so it's kind of turned to more of a, of a natural, normal, what, you know, helpful, like what are people literally asking, and then you put it in front of them so you're helpful and all that. But I know keyword research still plays a part, I would I would assume, but how, how okay. I guess, how, what do you do? Like how much does it, you know, you get all those ideas, do you go and look at which of the keywords are, you know, getting searched oh. more or anything like that? Like what? Oh, yeah. how much does it play a part right now? It's So the way I do it is I work backwards. I write the content first. So that that way I know that the content is uh, produced for human beings. <laughs> and then I say, okay, what do I want? What do I want the main theme of this to be? And typically I write the content and then I write the headline and the subheads and the SEO title and all that. So once so I sort go, of have that, yeah, I totally work backwards. No, 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 not that you work down, backwards. You just go natural, you know, the the human element of it. And then yep. you apply the technical. Right. So then once I have that down on paper, I go, okay, what what do I see as the main theme here? And then I go to Google AdWords, the keyword planner, and I look in okay. there to see, um, you know, is it – like today's blog post was about – on the day that we're recording this was about um, – beautifully written sentences that help you with your writing. So, you know, I, I keep a notebook full of quote, quotes that I've, in you know, just in reading fiction that something is written just beautifully that helps you visualize. So that was my blog post today as I just sort of listed all those out. And so I went into the Google AdWord key, or Keyword Planner to figure out what are people searching. Are they searching inspirational quotes? Are they uh, searching beautifully written sentences? What are they searching and then I wrote the SEO title and the description from that. Gotcha. That that's yeah. That that sounds like a really good way to go about it. You see what's actually literally happening to you in your world, in you, your world meaning your business world and marketplace. Right. And then you write to what's actually you know little people are literally asking, and then you go back and you worry about the technical aspects of you yes. know t title yes. tag, and that's all that I guess you might. Resculpt your first paragraph, I guess, possibly with with that, Maybe. and then your title or tag. I might, and, yeah. yeah, or I might throw in, you know, if I if the if I don't have the exact key phrase in there, I'll I'll yeah revise yeah. or revise the draft to get it in there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's all you really need to worry about is the you know the custom URL, the title tags, first paragraph, possibly, and then you know intermittently, you know. Make sure yep. you mention it, but not a ton, obviously. Okay, well, cool. Yeah, I mean, that was what I was going to say. I was going to ask you, where do you go to find the keyword research? So, you, you, and you found that to be your the keyword, key, the Google keyword AdWord planner works best for you. Yes. However, I will tell you that if you have a Moz account, it, and it's only available to premium subscribers, um, which I think is a hundred bucks a month, um, they have it all in one. So they have mm -hmm. the keyword search tool. They have the domain authority. They have everything you need there. You can hack it together um, with free tools, and Keyword Planner is free. So, But if you do have a Moz, M-O-Z, premium account, then yeah. I would go there versus Google. Yeah, I've been inch, you know, inching closer and closer. I learn about them. Um, was it Rand Fishkin? Is that right? Yep. Um, yep. Does that, yeah, I learn from him all the time, and he's just so entertaining as well. He's fun. <laughs> he has a uh, what is it called? Whiteboard Friday. If people My want to subscribe yep. to that, yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah, definitely look into them. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, yeah, those are some great pointers. And it's and, and just on a personal question, is it for um, like agency level, like you, or do you only get like a certain amount um, to 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 search for on that? Uh, I think it's agency. I think you can do okay. as much as you. I think they do it free for like you get like. Two or three, two or three searches a day for free, mm -hmm. and then you can. It's unlimited if you actually buy it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Now moving on to 
you know, working if you're working with an agency, a marketing agency like you know myself or, or you or whomever else, um, should you rely on them for ideas, or is it best to handle this internally? And if so, what role, you know, if it should, you know, be handled internally as far as the content ideas and all that, what role should an outside agency play for this part of it? I think it's a, I think it's a collaborative effort. Um, when you said to BCC your marketing team on those questions, I also jotted down to do the same with your agency because it okay. would be amazing. Our clients don't do that, and we're gonna, I will suggest that. It would be amazing if they co blind copied us on some of the conversations they're having with prospects and customers. So that I've never thought those about are, that either. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be amazing. I mean, I'm going to – I jotted it down so I don't forget to tell our client services I'm director. Doing, but, I'm doing it too right now, yeah. <laughs> That's a great um, idea. I, I can't believe I've never thought about that. I've mentioned this right? tip like 50 times, and I've never said, hey, why go. don't you do it for yourself? I just took it one step further for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. For real. Yeah. Like, thank you. That's awesome. Okay, um, go ahead. The other Sorry. thing I think that you should be doing as an agency is looking to see what the conversations, what conversations are happening on Twitter, um, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on, you know, uh, in, all the, uh, in all the social networks so that you can come back and say, well, I understand that you want to talk about your new location, but people are actually asking these questions and nobody's answering them on Twitter, for instance. And so then you can write content around that. So I think there's, I think it's a collaborative effort. It has to come from both sides. Okay. And uh, what are some good, good listening tools to, um, you know, monitor conversations on? I guess, uh, am I? I guess I'm assuming, assuming it's going to be. Twitter and uh, Facebook, or if if possible, LinkedIn. Do you know um, how you can go with the best way to go about that? We're using Zignal Labs, Z I G N A L Labs. Um, v I G N A L. Uh huh. It's okay. It's okay. It's better than anything else out there, but it's not quite to the standard that I would like to see. Of course, there's Radian Six and. Um, I think my team uses Sprout Social just for social specific. Uh, Zignal Labs sort of gives you everything, media, blogs, everything. Um, you can do free with Google Alerts or TalkWalker Alerts. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can, can go about it just depending on what your budget is or if you just want to do free. And free certainly okay. works. Google Alerts work. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And I assume you put in a couple keywords, not a lot, not like yep. – Exact yep. topics, just a couple keywords, and then see what yep. matches up with those. Okay, awesome. All right, um, kind of just to tie everything back here. Now, this is obviously it's pretty much the magic question: is you know how long should companies expect? You know, a B two B again, B two B companies should expect for everything to start to take off to see it work, as well as like how long to wait to see you know bigger benefits and results. So you kind of get to the point. First step is getting it going. The next step is, okay, seeing it kind of work. The next step would be seeing it work to the point where you're kind of paying for it, and then, then you get to the point where you break even, then you get to the point where you're making lots of money on it. So what, what are, what are, what's your kind of advice as far as, like, the patience? Because it's an investment. Uh, but what, 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 are you, investment. How, what have you seen? What have you seen as far as, like, a time frame? And, again, I know the, it's you know, going to be a range, but – it is, but I, you know, our experience is in B2B, so I will answer this from a B2B perspective. It takes a year to break even. And in year two, if you continue on the strategy and doing the things that are working, you'll start to make money. Yeah. That's kind of how I see it, too. You know, you know, even no matter how many times you say, hey, look, it takes four to six months for this thing to get cooking. Um, you're yep. in uh, week three, and they're getting anxious, <laughs> and I'm getting anxious yes. now because of it. <laughs> yes. And no. it's like I have to remind myself, as much as I preach these things, I, I, I'm for sure the one who gets the most anxious in our company, and it's, and it's funny because <laughs> I'm the biggest hypocrite. But I have to remind myself, and I kind of – in fact, it just happened, I think, this week, and I was like, you know, we just need to remind everybody we're in week three of a four- to six-month plan, you know, Week right. three, right? Right. Like, come right. on. It's about right. consistency, doing it over and over, and then the trust slowly starts to creep in. But the good news is if you are able to afford it and you are able to do it, this isn't a straw house. This is a brick house you're building. This isn't a yep. flash in the pan, banner ad, when you turn them off, they're gone, or SEM, when you turn it off, it's gone. This is your building momentum, and that momentum is going to take harder to get going, but it's going to take 
harder to stop as well. So yeah, if you can get to that year period, you're gonna you're gonna have a very very good inbound lead strategy going for yourself, and you won't have to worry about it anymore. So that that's yep, that's totally in a, I, yeah, that's good to hear. Well, cool. Well, do you have anything left uh, that you'd like to throw in or add? I mean, we've covered a lot. I think we've uh, hopefully really helped some people here. Um, do you have anything else, any parting thoughts? Yeah, I would just say that um, when you when you think about this, you're thinking about it sort of as a three-prong. You're thinking about it as you're building awareness and building trust, which is number one. You're building your search engine optimization, which allows you to show up on the first page of Google results and people find you, and that adds all the credibility from an organic perspective. And the, the third prong is that it's all about lead, lead generation. So if you set the program up effectively, you will hit all three of those. And most organizations only hit the awareness piece of it. And, you know, people may see that they have a blog and they're getting out there a little bit and people are sharing it and commenting on it and liking it. but it's not doing anything in terms of SEO or lead generation. So you have to t you have to really think about it from that three pronged approach and really make sure that it's integrated so that you do start to make some money. Mhm. Mm cool. Awesome. Well, Jenny, why don't you tell everybody again how they can continue to learn from you? I mentioned, you know, some of your stuff at the beginning, but if you can kind of give some details uh right now so that people can continue to follow and learn from you. Thank you. spinsucks.com is the best place. Spin sucks. Just go to spinsucks.com, and you are at Jeannie Dietrich, correct? That's G-I-N-I-D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H, at Jeannie yep. Dietrich, or at Spin Sucks on Twitter. Okay, well, awesome, Jeannie. Always entertaining and fun and informative, <laughs> and I think we accomplished all those things again. I greatly appreciate it, and I look forward to the next one, hopefully, sooner than later. Yes, me too. It's always good to talk to you. Awesome. Thanks, Jeannie.